Okay, hello everyone. This is Brother Gary Lee uh, once again with our Wednesday Bible study. I hope everyone's doing well. I've gotten notice of some that aren't, and we'll talk about that later on. We'll jump right in. But first, uh, you know, we need to look before we leap, so let's look to the Lord. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you that we can be together, even in this uh, unusual way. But we know that you are with us, each and every one of us, and therefore in Christ we are one. And we approach your throne of grace today, uh, seeking your divine will, and that you would talk to us and share with us uh, the things that we would uh, need to learn so that we can grow and better serve you in the days to come. Bless us now as we look into your word, for it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. All right, we're going to start in Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Now, while you're turning to that, you may notice I've got some, uh, oh, some red spots. I've been to the dermatologist, so don't let that frighten you. I, I'm not as pretty as I normally am, but it, I'll be back. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Here's what it says. He went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, uh, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Yeah, uh, it's uh, fairly important we understand a little bit about Levi. Levi was... Uh, of course, Matthew, Levi had the uh, position of the most despised, ridiculed, hated job in society. Uh, Levi was uh, a tax collector. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I know today people, I used to have a neighbor that worked for the IRS. We never did get too close, and that's just, just as well. <laughs> but uh, back in those days, uh, the Levi, or Matthew Levi was a Jew. And even though he was a Jew, he worked for the enemy. For you see that uh, and they were a people that uh, uh, had a foreign nation ruling over them, and taxing them, and it was uh, Matthew's job to take the, the taxes and uh, uh, give them to uh, uh, the Roman that was in charge. This position was one that you you received by, uh, you bid on the job. In other words, there would be a certain territory, and you would... Uh, uh, say how much that you to the Romans uh, that you uh, felt that you could uh, get from the people on behalf of the Romans in taxes and the highest bidder uh, that's how you got the job and uh, the way they made their living was of course uh, anything over and above what they had gotten the bid for uh, uh, that that was gravy that was money in the pocket so let's say it you know, it was ten dollars or something. Well, they could they could charge them twenty and keep ten for themselves. I mean, it, it was nobody liked them. Uh, nobody liked them at all. They were the most looked down upon people in their society. But Jesus, after he had uh, performed a miracle and uh, he had healed the paralytic, and and now uh, he went by the seaside, and uh, uh, the Bible says that many people uh, came to him. They followed him everywhere he went, and he taught them, and he passed by, and he saw Levi uh, sitting at the receipt of customs. He was going to get his money, 
Levi was. And Jesus passed by and Jesus said to uh, this man that had a, a good job, I guess, if, if you didn't care what people thought or if you, well, anyway, Jesus said to him, uh, the lowest on the scale, as far as the Jews was concerned, he says unto him, follow me. I think that's wonderful. It, it shows that anybody and everybody, uh, uh, the Lord can call them and they can get up and follow him. The Lord accepts them if they'll respond appropriately. It says immediately he arose and he followed him. You know, that's quite a, quite a uh, statement of faith, I think. Uh, you know, he, he gave up everything. I'm, I, all of them pretty much, they gave up an awful lot, I know. But uh, he gave up his uh, position that uh, get, uh, that uh, made it where he could accumulate large sums of money, and he just left it by the wayside, and he followed Jesus. Now, verse 15 says, It came to pass that as Jesus said at meet in the house, in other words, he went to dinner, uh, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Now, by publicans and sinners, you know, now uh, Matthew just just left the the ta the, uh, the the tax collector's table, and now he's gone uh, uh, to meet uh, with him in the house and with uh, with the disciples also, and they sat down to eat. And there were many uh, at that place to eat uh, that uh, were publicans and sinners. You know, Levi, Matthew, uh, was a sinner. Anybody, you know, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, everybody was a sinner except them. But Levi definitely uh, was a sinner. And when Jesus, uh, when the scribes heard it, and they saw him eat with the public and the sinners. They said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with the public and sinners? And Jesus heard it. He said unto them, They that are whole have need, has no need of the physicians, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, how many of you are righteous? There is none righteous, no, not one, except the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the only one that was ever perfect. Uh, and Jesus came to call sinners, the unrighteous, to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he was calling them into the fold. He was calling them into glory one day. He was calling them that they might be with the Lord God Almighty for all eternity. He was calling them out of the gutter. He was calling them over on the wayside. He was calling them that, that were in trouble. He was calling them that were in the prisons. He was calling uh, them that just were everyday people. Uh, he was calling people to come. And he's calling them now. He's saying, come and follow me. Uh, Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole, verse 17, have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to, to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Are you a sinner? What does the Bible say? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. I mean, let's just face it. Uh, yeah. You try to do good, you try to do your best, but nevertheless, you sin. Nevertheless, whether you do it in action or in mind, it's a sin if it's not uh, in accordance with the Word of God. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that is the, the difficulty that all of humanity finds itself in. But God loves us. And the Bible says that he loved us so much then that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to die for sinners. What a glorious God we have. Now, look, look here. 
verse 18. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees uh, fast? But thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Those days. That's these days. Now, by fasting, that means to, to give up. To give up uh, uh, food. Uh, some people, uh, they used to give up uh, meat on Fridays. I know the Roman Catholics did. I didn't think that was a bad thing if you did it for the right reasons. But that's not really fasting. I want to tell you all something. I've had some salads that are pretty good. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and seen uh, people, you know, they're usually the real big people, and they say, well, I'm just going to have a salad. And they can barely, barely carry the thing to the table. It's a full. Fasting is to, to sacrifice, to give up. And you need some common sense. I'm, I need to tell you that when you fast. If you're a diabetic, you better be careful. You talk to your doctor about it. Uh, you know, God, God doesn't, uh, he doesn't, uh, you shouldn't tip God with fasting. Other people will say, I've done this. Terrible thing. Uh, I say, well, Lord, I'm going to fast. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I need to lose some weight anyway. That isn't why you fast. You do it for the glory of God. And in fasting, the Lord, I mean, true fasting for the right reasons, the right purposes, to honor God, he'll bless you for it. He'll bless you for it. Uh, Jesus here, he, he alludes to who he is. He's the bridegroom. You know, he's the bridegroom of the church. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's the groom. We're the bride. Now, I never thought about myself being a bride before, but that, that's what that's the way it is. The relationship is what it's talking about. You know, he takes care of us. He sees to our needs. He, he gives us the supply that's necessary, uh, both for now and in the hereafter. Let's go to verse 21. Says no man also soweth a piece of new cloth. Now he's going to give two examples here. And I, I'm not a I should have asked my wife about this. She taught him home ec for hundred years. I should have asked her. But I'll go ahead with it. it. Says he he says, No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old and the rent is made worse. I guess that's what you're telling you is that, you know, if you have a rip in your pants and you, you, you need to patch it, well, if they're old overalls or something, you need to, to patch it and, and you don't take new cloth to patch it because if you do so, uh, it's going to be worse. It's going to come apart. And it will rent. It will tear even worse, it says here. Now, verse 22. It says, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles. This is very interesting. Uh, it might not seem it the way I'm delivering it, but I'm telling you, to me, it's interesting. It says, No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles. And the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. You know, I don't think that uh, wine bottles are recycled. They recycle them in the sense that they discard them and make something else out of them. But they don't use them again for wine. According to this, they're, they're, they're liable to explode. Now, what's, what's the application here? Well, 
when we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts, we must be a new person. You know, he makes us all brand new. I mean, we might look somewhat the same, but our attitude's different. Our loves change. Our associations change. Uh, the things we do change. Our habits especially. Uh, we're a new creature in Christ. We're born from above. We're born again. And uh, I think that's what it's referring to here, you know. Uh, if he would just put, if if Jesus came into us and we remained the, the same, we'd go straight to hell. You say, well, how can you say that? Jesus said, you must be born again. Born again from above and on the inside. We are new creatures in Christ. So think about that. Verse 23. It came to pass, and that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees, remember the Pharisees, they're the highfalutin uh, ecclesiastical uppity ups. Uh, it says, uh, uh, The Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? It was against the law. They had a law for everything, not just the Ten Commandments. Though the Jewish uh, rabbis uh, uh, had just uh, untold numbers of laws, and uh, they had a law for everything. And on Sunday, or on the Sabbath, or the day of the Lord, the day in which you worship for us, uh, it wasn't allowed uh, for you to do any work. Uh, Jesus addressed that in more than just this place. We'll look at that later on. Uh, but it, it, here is disciples. Uh, they're working, you know. They're, they're getting themselves something to eat. They're, and that was legal, by the way. Uh, you could go into the fields on the Sabbath, uh, or, or on, I guess it was the Sabbath, and uh, you could you could get the uh, here it says corn, they pluck them. That's the work, but it was legal to go in the fields and get it if it was on the ground. You know they just couldn't do any work to, uh, plucking it off. Well. The Pharisees uh, pointed out uh, this, and uh, and it's a sad thing. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, growing up, and I was at my grandma's house, and uh, every Sunday we had a big feast, but she didn't cook. She cooked on Saturday, so I guess you'd say we had leftovers on Sunday. But really, we didn't. She had it cooked specifically, food specifically for the Lord's Day. And uh, we had a feast. But she didn't cook it on Sunday. Things have changed. You know, I've thought, hey, this is terrible. I've thought about this. I've been sitting in a restaurant on Sunday after church. All just having a big old meal and a big old... Well, I don't, I'm making myself hungry. I don't want to go there. But, you know, have, having a, a good meal, and now I'm saying to myself, you know, I wish these people, these waitresses and these chefs and these whatever else they're doing, I wish they didn't have to work on Sunday. Why do they work on Sunday? Because of me. Because of you. You know, they used to have what they call blue law. You weren't allowed to work on Sunday. But the world, if it's, if this is a, the world's got more worldly. Does that make sense? And it's doing more so even to, to today. Um, you say, well, if I tell somebody young that about the blue laws, they say, well, that was the old days. Things change. God doesn't change. He hasn't changed once. Not one little bit. All right. Verse 25. Normally I'd stop there and i ask any questions or comments. And uh, 
You can question, comment all you want. <laughs> uh, or you can write me and I'll do my best to answer you. Verse 25. He said unto them, Have you never read what David did? Now he responded to this foolishness. He said, Haven't you ever read what David did when he had need and was hungered, he and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. He went into the temple, the synagogue, and what bread there was on the altar, he ate it, he was hungry. You know, I had a little boy once, uh, we were having communion one day and we, we would break off, you know, our own piece of bread and uh, uh, a little, little young boy, he wasn't little, young boy, he, he should have known better, but he, he took off a piece of bread and uh, <laughs> he, he ate that bread. The bread got on around somewhere else in the church and it was being passed and and uh, and he he poked his mama and he said mama uh, can we have seconds <laughs> i think about that a lot anyway uh jesus said to them verse 27 the sabbath the day of worship was made for man and not man for the sabbath Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Let me repeat that again. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. We weren't made for that. But God made it for us so that we could commune with him. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. You know, Jesus fulfilled the law. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to still obey the law, but he fulfilled the law, and he set us free. He set us free. Uh, not free to sin, and not free to run about and, and jump all around, do whatever that was uh, obnoxious or wrong, but uh, he set us free from the penalty of sin, which is death and eternal damnation. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Uh, now we'll stop right there. Here's the question for you. Is Jesus your Lord? Yeah, now hold on. Now I know that uh, most of you will say uh, he's, he's the Son of God. Uh, uh, he, he's the great prophet and... and uh, He's the miracle worker, and, uh, and da, 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 da. Is he your savior? All right, that's one thing. Is he your savior? If he is truly your savior, he's Lord. Is he your Lord? Now, Lord is master. Is he in charge? Is he in charge of your home? Now, some of y'all say, well, my wife is. Well, <laughs> that ain't the way it's supposed to be. Some of y'all say, well, my husband is. You know, he makes all the decisions. That ain't the way it's supposed to be either. Jesus is Lord. And we should be doing his will. He's, he's the Lord of everything. He's the master. He set the example. He showed us. Now, we'll never be perfect until we get into heaven and we get a new body. Right now, we're, we're kind of crippled with, with what we have. But he, he is Lord. He's master. Is he the master of your life? And some people say, well, yeah. He, he kind of, no, there's no kind of about it. If he's master, how much time have you spent with him today? How much time have you been into the word of God today? How much time have you been praying? How much time have you been doing good deeds? How much time have you committed unto him? Then it will be able, you'll be able to see. Just write it down on a piece of paper. Answer those questions. 
And I, I know in my case, uh, I spent a lot of time in, in, in the Word. Uh, I know I seem like a country preacher. Well, I am. But I still spend a lot of time in the Word. And I spend time praying. Uh, I appreciate the prayer warriors. You know, they're the, boy, they're the backbone of the church. And uh, I appreciate the sunshiners. They're, they're the, they're, they're prayer warriors too. And I appreciate receiving all the requests. But how much time do you spend every day praying? Do you have a list? I don't know about you, but I can't remember everything. I never could. Couldn't when I was a kid. So you got to write down a list. You got to take notes. And then while you're praying, there's nothing wrong with opening one eye to see who's next on the list to be praying for. Amen. All right. Speaking of prayer, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a minute. I got my list here. And I've got received thus far. Here's where, here we go. We need to pray for Megan, M-E-G-A-N, Megan and Gary. Now, that was for travel mercies, and I'm assuming that's been accomplished. Uh, you might want to let me know. Uh, but uh, just in case, go ahead and pray for them, that their traveling would be uh, safe. We need to pray for a lady named Mary. Mary has bone cancer. Uh, pray for Mary. Of course, pray for her healing, complete and total. But also, if, if it's if she must have it, that uh, the doctors would be able to deal with it and help her and restore her to good health by the grace of God. Think about that. By the grace of God. That's Mary. Uh, Diane Nicoletta's niece has cancer. I don't know of anybody anywhere that doesn't have family or themselves that hasn't had cancer. Diane is concerned for her niece, and I, that's so wonderful she is. Now let's pray for her niece. I don't have that name, uh, but she has cancer. Uh, Ellen uh, has a friend, that's Ella Duran, uh, named uh, Nancy. Uh, Nancy has uh, trouble with high blood pressure. Now, most of us, when you get our age, you, that's commonplace. Nevertheless, it's still dangerous. My dad had a lot of trouble with his blood pressure. And he, it took him over a year in the hospital, not out, in to get his blood pressure regulated. And uh, he died at 59. So pray for Ellen's friend named Nancy that her blood pressure would be regulated and she'd be uh, calm and that she, she, it would lower and, and uh, it would be safe. We have uh, Barb, uh, I don't have the last name here, she has a detached retina. That's that's a that's a difficult thing to deal with. Uh, so pray for Barb that her eye would would uh, be be healed. Lady named Gert. She has breast cancer. Um, unfortunately, this is a common cancer amongst women. Men get it too, but mostly women. And so we we want to pray for Gert that. Uh, uh, decisions would be made to properly address it and that she uh, would be healed. Um, I'm trying to read my own writing. Joan Ingholt. I think that's it. Joan Ingholt. 87 year old uh, broke her leg. 87 years old. Uh, that that's hard to recover from, but it can be done. I've known some that have done it. 
but it's got to be terrible and pain-wise. So pray for her recovery, if it be the Lord's will. Pray for the people of Kenosha, uh, Kenosha, where the riots have been going on, and they've, they've gotten out of hand. I pray that uh, there be some good sense. And that, you know, pray that non-Christians would behave like Christians. How's that? And then we as Christians would set a good example. Boy, that would that would straighten a lot of things out, wouldn't it? Pray for the people of Kenosha. That's a trying thing. Uh, there's a fellow named uh, Dale. Pray for Dale. He has leukemia. Uh, my sister has leukemia, but she's, she's in remission. Uh, it, it can be dealt with. Uh, let's pray that Dale... Uh, would be healed, uh, or at least go into remission. Uh, pray for his wife, Karen. That's you know when one is injured, the, the spouse is injured also. So let's pray for the the family. Wife is Karen. Uh, pray for Jay. He has abdominal. I don't know how to say this. Abdominal. He has. Pain in his abdomen. How's that? <laughs> Abominable. That's wrong. He has pain in his abdomen. Uh, pray, pray that you know they be able to find out what's causing it, and that he be that he 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 be set right, and, and the pain would go away. His wife is terribly worried about him, and and uh, you know he's hurting, so she's hurting. His wife's name is Debbie, so put Jay and Debbie in your prayers. Billy Elliot. Pray for good old Bill Elliott, you know, uh, Bill uh, bent over and fell and uh, broke a bone in his hip. Uh, I talked to his wife, Peg, today, and he's, uh, she said he's doing better than they ever expected, and she, she was really upbeat. She was sounding so good. Uh, they're settled in their their new home up in Vermont, and uh, I told them, uh, you know, when when winter gets here, he shouldn't be ice skating. Remember Bill Elliott as he recovers. I love Bill and, and Peg Bo. Uh, here's one I want everybody to make sure you get. You get it good. Don't forget it. You pray for him every day. All of these, of course, but. This one is a six-year-old named Kaylin. Uh, he is uh, autistic, and he's been abused. Pray for this. Pray for Kaylin. Pray for Barb Hellman. She's in the hospital, last I heard. Pray for her. I, I hope Barb's doing doing well out of the hospital by now. Also, Herma was supposed to go, uh, I think, today. No, two days ago. And uh, she's had trouble with her her eye. She had uh, cataract surgery. There's difficulty now. So pray that uh, Herma be all right. The Lord take care of her. The Lord would fix that eye and, and put it uh, so she can just stare at, at Dwayne all she wants to. <laughs> oh, Lord, help her. <laughs> Pray for Herma and her eye. Uh, any other prayer requests, you'll have to just uh, let Crystal know. And Crystal is so kind to send me and, and everybody, so many others, uh, uh, the information. Let her know. Uh, and if you need to uh, respond to me directly, you do so. Let's go down to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you because you are the great physician. You are the one who is able to heal. You are the one that sets the destiny of every soul in this world. You are a great and wonderful sovereign God, and we praise you, Lord even in the difficulties of life, because, of dear Lord, we know that you are in control. We have named numbers of people here already. 
And we ask that you would look kindly upon them, that, that they would be, uh, if it be thy will, you'd heal them right now, right where they are. And we ask, dear Lord God, that uh, whatever the needs might be that have been presented to us, that uh, you would uh, take care of them in a way that uh, they would rejoice. No matter what, may we all rejoice in good and bad because you're our God. And we know one day we're going to receive a new body. And we look forward to being with you in eternity. We hate to see people go from this world, Lord, but we know that they're all going to a better place, all of us, if they're born again. We thank you for your word today, Lord. We thank you, dear Lord God, for the, the word that encourages us, that strengthens us, that inspires us. Only you can do all those things, and we are grateful for your kindness and your generosity and the old outflowing of your Holy Spirit. We pray, dear Lord, for our nation and its leaders especially. From the top down to the bottom, Lord, set them right. May they each humble themselves and call upon Jesus. May they seek to do thy will. May they be humbled. And all of us rejoice in the things that you will do if we simply give it over to thee. Help us all to be nicer, Lord. Help us to be kinder help us to love yes even our enemies help us to do that lord if there are our enemies lord let us be reminded we're probably theirs so mend the fences please lord be with us now and forever especially until we come back next week in jesus christ's name we pray amen and amen. God bless you all. See you soon.